CEC Gurukul lecture series and uh, we have been uh, uh, organizing a uh, lecture series on uh, romantic trend in English literature and uh, for this uh, uh, series today uh, we have the topic the later romantic women poets and it means that there has been already a lecture on the early uh, romantic women poets uh, you know which was a distinct voice in romantic writing and uh, in the period uh, that uh, you know uh, came later and uh, other pressures and the problems also emerged so uh, it, it gave us the idea that uh, the uh, romantic trend should be seen also in the light of what happened let's say in the early years of the 19th century so uh, for this we have today uh, our expert dr pal nagpal uh, who teaches uh, english literature in janki devi memorial college delhi and she is our expert speaker today and uh, before i request her to uh, begin uh, let me tell you that uh, this romantic period uh, says something that was not actually the case uh, in, in in terms of presenting experience in the 18th century so it was a break from the 18th century it was a kind of shift you know of emphasis from urban writing from the writing of the uh, literati writing of for, for the cult high cultured people and uh, uh, attention was then you know diverted to the to the village uh, to to simplicity to spontaneity uh, in in writing and that simplicity and ordinariness was a, was a value in english literature that was recognized uh, in the romantic period for the first time so dr parnak pal uh, first welcome you and uh, then uh, uh, <coughs> i request you to to give us an idea about what the word later would signify in the case of today's lecture uh thank you professor prakash uh today's lectures you pointed out will be on the later women romantics and we're looking at them primarily in terms of uh, the year in which they were born which was uh, towards the latter part of the 18th century which means that their active years would be the first uh, uh, you know two or three decades mm -hmm. of the 19th century mm -hmm. and uh, in the early women romantic poets we noticed how uh, towards the end of the 18th century uh you know they were talking about uh, they were picking up images and concepts from their day to day life it could be from the domestic space it could be about institutions that they were familiar with for instance that of the married woman or the mother at the same time they were also able to uh look beyond it mm -hmm. and think about events that were happening around them mm -hmm. so uh that i think was very very important and shifted the entire perspective in a sense and oh. made a very significant intervention uh in terms of the romantic period that is to follow so far as uh, i understand uh, <coughs> what, you, what you mean to say is that uh, in the early romantic poets you saw the home you saw the personal life but here the uh, that trend is evolving into something wider and that women start looking beyond the home and and beyond the spontaneous way in which they lived earlier would you say that uh yes <coughs> though of course uh, there were poets like uh, mary robinson who were able to kind of really speaking talk about the new london that was emerging mm -hmm. in terms of all the people who worked there and create a uh, a picture uh, you know almost like a portrait of london through her poetry mm -hmm. and uh, in today's uh, lecture uh, to create a kind of bridge um, you know i'm also going to be talking about uh, a kind of uh, a poet who came from uh, the ordinary sections of the society and was known as uh, the milk woman of bristol mm -hmm. so this is uh, and yearsley now and yearsley technically would uh, you know be part of the early uh, romantics but uh, since we had discussed um, established poets like uh, mary robinson and uh, the others i thought it would be significant to look at a kind of bridge between these two uh, though there's no such demarcation it's uh, only uh, you know for the purpose of this lecture we've created this demarcation but ann yearsley's uh, years if you look at it she was born in 1753 and lived up to 1806 mm. but uh, is representative of a poetry that was coming in a big way from the ordinary sections of the society mm. and i thought that would also kind of uh, make a significant uh, intervention and contribution to our understanding of romanticism it also occurs to me that uh, you know in the second part which is let's, let's say the later poets there is also a, an awareness uh, of the influence of french revolution in the later years yes. initially this was very inspiring later on when it became a kind of movement uh, that you know didn't uh, uh, meet the expectations of certain things that 
uh, the revolution stood for. So, maybe there was some kind of disenchantment, disillusionment or sense of realism. What would you say regarding that? In fact, it is very interesting and one of the reasons I actually thought that you know we could have a bridge poet here which would be Anne Yersley in this case is that uh, a lot I mean the women poets are actually taking on from the French Revolution as you rightly put it are very very critical of England's idea of expansion at that point of time. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of imperialism and colonization as it stood was something that uh, they were not very comfortable with mm -hmm. and uh, on the one hand is this whole idea of building the English nation and at the same time uh, the there is a huge discomfort that we see especially in the women poets of the time vis-a-vis -vis this idea of expansion. This is significant. And, uh, yes mm -hmm. and as you very rightly pointed out that you know there is a kind of disenchantment you know when things do not turn out the way uh, uh, people in England had imagined things to be post the French Revolution. So, there is also because we are looking at wim writing by women, mm -hmm. there is a kind of uh, movement back in a sense uh, to a kind of mold that already existed which if you look at it in terms of the history of English literature, it you know kind of conveniently then moves into the whole idea of uh, the Victorian a uh, woman uh, you know some years later. So, we can see uh, you know traces and the beginnings of that towards uh, the end of the romantic period in that sense in the writings of these women. This means technically it is romantic, but then women also bring a kind of realism into it yes. and, and make that uh, romanticism very concrete. Very concrete mm -hmm. and uh, so, um, uh, <coughs> if we just take a look at Anne Yearsley and as I said that you know I mean technically uh, she would belong to the earlier period. So, but uh, it is important to also uh, look at and discuss uh, uh, the poets who came from uh, you know you, we had uh, the ploughman poet, the thresher poet and Anne Yearsley in this case was known as the wilk, uh, milk woman of Bristol. Her patroness was Hannah Moore who is also um, a writer, poet and with the help of uh, uh, Elizabeth Montague she set up a subscription for uh, Anne Yearsley and uh, there is of course the very famous uh, controversy about how uh, you know Hannah Moore I, uh, and uh, wanted to control the profits uh, initial profits that were made by the publication of Anne Yearsley's uh, poetry. But uh, if we leave that uh, aside for the moment and concentrate on Anne Yearsley's poetry we see that you know she is able to kind of gradually uh, evolve as a very very accomplished uh, poet and uh, coming from a context where uh, she was a milk woman and uh, along with her husband and I think about seven children she was living in dire poverty when uh, she when Hannah Moore actually took her under her wing and um, the women uh, you know poets like Anne Yearsley ha consistently resisted the slave trade in their poetry and this is very important you know because this is the time when we are also talking about a kind of nation building that is happening and at the same time you know this movement into uh, I mean nation building in that sense of course you know uh, late 16th century onwards one had been talking about it. But in this context it is very very specific and you know in uh, uh, alliance with the entire imperial program. And uh, it is important because uh, a lot of profits at this point of time are being made by the colonial powers through uh, slave trade. And uh, Anne Yearsley, uh, you know, is very, very sharply critical of it. But before we actually uh, examine Anne Yearsley's poetry, where she's critical of, uh, you know, the slave trade, uh, this uh, I'd just like to draw attention to uh, her poem called uh, "On Mrs. Montague." Uh, this is uh, you know part of the collection that was published in 1785 and uh, the, the, the tone is so absolutely uninhibited that uh, you know when we look at the early uh, women romantics we see that uh, you know in their presence we have a poet who is absolutely uninhibited in terms of her writing. So, for instance uh, the very first lines go like this, why boast O arrogant imperious man? Perfection so exclusive? It is a question that is being asked. Are thy powers nearer approaching deity? Canst thou solve questions which high infinity propounds? So nobler flights or dare immortal deeds? Unknown to woman, if she greatly dares to use the powers assigned her. Active strength, the boast of animals is clearly thine. By this upheld, thou thinkest the lesson rare that female virtues teach and poor the height 
which female wit obtains so anya's lay is absolutely direct in her approach and is uh, totally uh, you know kind of coming forth and addressing the man as arrogant and imperious and the word imperious of course has connotations here and uh, uh, where uh, you know she of course uh, uh, looks at the man as somebody who's excelling in what she calls active uh, active strength but she calls this the boast of animals and uh, which is which means the kind of masculinity that the men were talking about in those days is uh, tantamount or is equivalent in a sense to uh, a kind of savagery that's there and uh, she says that you know you think the lesson rare uh, that female virtues teach and for that reason because the men are mostly involved in this display of uh, masculinity they rarely think about the female virtues and uh, the whole idea of female wit which remains out of their bounds so uh, we have a tone that is very very direct a tone that is strong and uh, there is uh, you know um, uh, it, it's not an apologetic tone on uh, by any means it's it's extremely uh, uh, an extremely strong voice that emerges and uh, here i'd like to uh, request professor prakash to uh, also kind of comment on these lines by anyasley um i think uh, <coughs> women uh, have got their voice in romanticism in in a big way as you uh, point out uh, for like calling the men imperious and the arrogant and uh, people you know who believe in themselves and uh, want to suppress others and calling them animalish and savage this is something that at that point of time would be rare mm-hmm. and in the 18th century which was supposed to be the century of etiquette and good manners and uh, women were suppressed you know under this kind of a pressure so i think this voice was necessary for 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 the women folk to come forward and challenge men for the wrong things that they were doing so it's it's, it's a voice that should be welcomed yes. and uh, this must have created a different kind of culture where uh, equality between men and women would emerge as an as an important idea yes and and for this reason there there has been you know of late a lot of attention that has been paid to anya's list poetry mm-hmm. and uh, if we look at the second poem by her which is called uh, a poem on the inhum- inhumanity of the slave trade which was written in 1788 mm. and which is so very close in that sense to the french revolution that uh, we really speaking look at it in terms of uh, uh you know um, a voice that is very critical of uh, the ways of the nation and uh, its uh, its entire idea of masculinist uh, expansion uh, can you on the sides tell us something about the the, the reality of the slave trade then is any idea regarding that See, this what, was what, the what, time what it was. Uh, actually mm. uh, another poet uh, that we are going to uh, discuss uh, you know after an yearsly mm. she talks very explicitly about it and mm. uh, on the one hand is talking about the way soldiers are going from england and colonizing other areas so wars are being fought and places are so to say being discovered in the sense and by the nation and men are being nation. brought as animals yes. to england to yes. work on the fields they are being brought to work on the fields and at the same time what's also important is that there are men who are dying there in the process yes. you know even from the english side there are men who are dying mm-hmm. and uh, there is a uh, the women poets particularly talk a lot about this and are very very uncomfortable with this idea we 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 in uh, india would have a slave but this kind of slave trade you know that there, there are markets there is a market place where men can be bought to work and and you know where they can the, their their body is so important so productive you know that it can be invested into the, the labor power of england absolutely and and then once bought they can you know use them uh, it's it's like uh, you know uh, they they ownership the whole idea of ownership of controlling mm-hmm. uh, the the body and the mind of course of the slave and uh, you know kind of making use of his physical strength and prowess on the fields and uh, for wh- whatever other work that the colonizer requires and uh, the human being who would be otherwise living let's say 50 60 years uh, dies as a slave at the age of 30, 30. and uh, he has to be replaced by another young man of 20 yes this is something so most inhuman inhuman and and markets where this is happening yes so it's extremely inhuman mm. and it is socially sanctioned yes. the government supports it the money power in england also supports it and i think romantic poets are the first ones to raise their voice against the, the, this, this practice yes. and we have to acknowledge how the women are really opposing this 
Uh, how come uh, women oppose it? So uh, Anne Yersley here, in, uh, she's got a poem that's titled, a poem on the inhumanity of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said that, you know, coming in 1788, mm -hmm. it's very significant because, uh, I mean, the French Revolution of 1789 is about to occur. Mm -hmm. And she writes, uh, Bristol, thine heart hath throbbed to glory. Mm -hmm. Slaves, even Christian slaves, have shook their chains and gazed with wonder and amazement on thee. Hence, ye groveling souls, who think the term I give, of Christian slave, a paradox to you. Mm -hmm. I do not turn, but leave you to conception. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important that she's calling the slave, not pagan, but the slave is a Christian slave, mm -hmm. and is, is saying that this might seem a paradox to you. And she says this because she uh, is critical of uh, the people who are uh, who ensure that the slave trade uh, continues and are people who are buying and selling these uh, people so she says that uh, narrow with what be th with that be blessed nor dare to stretch your shackled souls along the course of freedom curse on the toils spread by a christian hand mm -hmm. to rob the indian of his freedom mm -hmm. curse on him who from a bending parent steals Thou fleeting goods to individuals see how much for thee they care, how wide the eye ope. So, uh, in in this um, uh, way, uh, you know, in, uh, I mean, his dear support of age, his darling child, perhaps a son or a more tender daughter. So, uh, this whole idea that after all, uh, she's doing two or three things. One, drawing attention to the fact that these are also people who are families of their own. Mm. And the reference to the Indian slave, I think, makes the point felt very, very, uh, in a very pertinent manner. Mm. And also how they have been totally, uh, you know, uh, uprooted from their uh, place, uh, their family, their context, and are uh, being sold elsewhere and are being exploited for work. So, um, <coughs> and uh, particularly women poets, you know, talking about uh, slave trade and its inhumanity and its savageness, and then you know, compelling uh, the, the reader to understand, you know, that uh, English males are uh, enslaving uh, males from elsewhere, and uh, they are they are being traded. And secondly, that since they have done the same thing to women uh, at, at home, so I think women poets are able to better relate to the, the suffering and the pain of the slaves that are brought from outside. And it's important because I think they sense their own marginality mm -hmm. as much as, uh, you know, uh, they, they look at this whole business of slave trade and are understanding, uh, you know, through their own poetry, the marginality of the slaves. Mm -hmm. So they are able to connect, I think, at that level. So it's, it's a plane of a different kind. Yes. It is a plane that also brings in, you know, the social inequality maybe between the master and the slave. Uh, on one side, and, and 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 the English whites and the and the blacks from elsewhere or browns from elsewhere who have been brought here as, as slaves, and will be just uh, treated as animals because their their labor is important. Yes, and mm. so you know through this whole idea that they belong to somebody or or a family. So she says that you know I know the crafty merchant will oppose the plea of nature to my strain, and urge his toils are for his children. The soft plea dissolves my soul. But when I sell a son, thou god of nature, let it be my own. So she says that, you know, where the crafty merchant, you know, mm. people, these are the people who are making money through this business. And she says that, you know, if, if they are doing it for their children, then it's only a woman, I think, who can say this here, that but when I sell a son, thou god of nature, let it be my own. Uh, my, my mind, in fact, goes, goes back to the 18th century with sore by intellect. And uh, that intellect is given a new word by the women romantic poets called crafty. Yes. So, so a human mind can you know create a, a sense of cleverness, and that cleverness can be socially very negative. Very negative. Mm. That's the point you know wor wor worth considering uh, in, in the context of women writing poetry, bringing uh, uh, just not the sense of pain, but also the sense of anger. The anger that is there in calling you know the mental activity crafty is something that straight away takes us from the human being to the trader. Yes. Mm. And also when we look at the fact that um, Anne Yersley belongs to, you know, the, I mean, she being a milk woman, it's, it's uh, though of course, uh, you know, she's not received any kind of formal training, but uh, she does receive Hannah Moore's patronage. But um, 
it's important that uh, when we talk about romanticism and we talk about wordsworth and the other romantic poets the established poets but there's so much that's happening before uh, they start to write and uh, if we look at poetry of the sort we we realize that they are already women like anias they are already talking about a move to nature to talk about uh, a kind of sensitivity in understanding and the process of writing which uh, you know is something that's taken up in a very big way uh, in the romantic period mm -hmm. and uh, with this uh, we move to uh, the next poet uh, felicia dorothy hemans also uh, very famously known as mrs hemans uh, she was born in 1793 and lived up to 1835 and uh, felicia dorothy hemans uh, you know at the age of 15 uh she published uh, poems england and spain or valor and patriotism so you know a very very she started writing when she was very young she also wrote the domestic affections and other poems she brought many more uh, brought out many more collections after this and uh, you know lives just up to 1835 now mrs hemans was widely read and uh, she was one of the first women actually to make money by writing in verse and uh, so the whole idea of a young poet and uh, somebody who's writing and is also turning it into a vocation in fact it is said that she was the highest paid writer in blackwoods and was only next to uh, lord byron and uh, sir walter scott so uh, she writes uh, you know in 1822 and uh, which is a point that was just raised by uh, professor prakash also that you know um, post uh, you know the french revolution how the initial euphoria and the dream of a totally uh, equal world and a uh, totally democratic world how that dream uh, could not really uh, be fulfilled and uh, we have a poem by uh, mrs hemans and it's very interesting it's called england's dead and it was uh, uh, you know published in 1822 so in england's dead uh, if we look at uh, the stanzas uh, that are there in this poem she writes in the quatrain form and uh, uh, you know where in the second stanza the last line of the second stanza she raises a question where rest not england's dead and then uh, moves on in the you know subsequent stanzas to uh, uh, you know in each uh, stanza the last line is there slumber england's dead uh, after every uh, you know almost every alternate stanza there slumber england's dead now uh, if we look at the places that she mentions so for instance uh, son of the ocean isle where sleep your mighty dead show me what high and stately pile is red over glory's bed and so uh, you know the the movement begins from egypt egypt's burning plains from there uh, you know where there is the angry sun and and in that sense the sun is conquered by the english so there slumber england's dead moving on from there uh, you know there are other places for instance uh, the hurricane hath might along the indian shore and far by ganges banks at night is heard the tiger's roar but let the sound roll on it hath no, no tone of dread for those that from their toils are gone their slumber england's dead now the poem continues in from egypt to india to colombia and uh, you know the the snowy pyrenees and uh, uh, many such places that mrs hemans covers now it does two or three things the poem works at various levels at at the first level it all these places uh, you know tell us about the whole idea of expansion english expansion english colonization the whole imperial policy and the way they are sending their soldiers out to other countries to conquer these places and at the same time where uh, you know she's uh, all these places as projected in mrs hemans poetry uh, all these places are also known for uh, you know rough uh, terrains and difficult weather conditions and it's the english soldier who conquers all but in the process they also die and so where on the one hand this is a poem that's often uh, been celebrated uh, you know for a, a kind of a um, nation building exercise that's happening in england with its with its expanding boundaries and so on but i would find it difficult to go along with this kind of an interpretation because uh, the the line uh, you know at uh, the end of every alternate stanza 
that their sleep England's dead uh, tells us how she also mourns and this is in that sense a poem of mourning because she is mourning the the death of the English soldiers in all these places and uh, in that sense the kind of valor on which this whole idea of uh, 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 nationalism is based is something that Mrs. Hemans is very critical of. So here uh, again uh, I would no, no, I, I um, it, it, you know, uh, uh, occurred to me in the context of uh, your discussion that uh, this is not romanticism of the kind that we are familiar with. In England, there are women who notice that, you know, uh, England is expanding. Eng England is, you know, spreading its influence all over the world and is subjecting other nations uh, in, in, into that kind of, you know, slavery, virtual or real. And uh, this, this is a poem, this is a poetry, this is a poetic trend that is uh, rather realistic in, yes. in terms of, it is sociological. Uh, straight away one can connect, you know, with the, with the English arrogance and, and, and the, you know, uh, suffering that they cause to the people elsewhere. So, uh, th th this is going to be the subject of uh, English fiction in, in the later part of the 19th century. Hardy comes to mind, Dickens comes to mind and these people are talking about what is happening in society. So, these women in the late 18th century uh, refer to the coming of uh, realism uh, in fiction later uh, in, in terms of their own perception, the way they uh, look around. That is the first point. And the second is, I think that the point that you have made is, uh, I think that this is, uh, uh, this should be gone into still further. Uh, by by uh, readers, uh, you have a view of uh, you know English mourning, where you know when the English soldier dies, then there are, there are two aspects that open. One that the English soldier was an instrument of the ru English ruling class, and they were spreading that kind of violence. And finally, the soldier dies, which means uh, he also uh, meets death. So, uh, what about the people that the soldier killed uh, in his activity days of activity? And when finally he dies, then there is a kind of sadness. So, you know, it connects the English soldier in death with the slaves elsewhere, but till the time the soldier died, he was perpetrating that kind of thing. So, there is a kind of paradox, there is a kind of irony and women are able to see the irony, either visibly or invisibly, it depends. So, it is very problematic, you know, that uh, uh, English soldiers and the, and the slaves ultimately meet the same end. So, that is where the paradox occurs. Uh, absolutely and uh, you know I would agree with both points and uh, where we talk about a very very realistic strain in their poetry I think uh, if we look at England's dead and the, the date being 1822 it's it's pretty much right into the romantic period mm. but at the same time uh, where she where they're making use of images from nature and of course the whole idea of uh, the poet's perception of the world is there uh, but the the strain into which these images are strong. I think that is a very, very realistic strain that's being used. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, though, of course, uh, you know, these are poems that um, uh, are written by uh, the women poets, there are others also, uh, you know, where they talk about nature in detail. But their view uh, of nature in that sense is quite different, I should say, from the uh, male romantic poets, mm -hmm. if at all we, you know, make a distinct uh, difference here. Uh, to move to the second point that you made about the paradox that is there and if we just look at one stanza carefully uh, for instance go stranger track the deep free free the white sail spread wave may not form nor wild wind sweep where rest not England's dead so on the one hand uh, you know uh, each stanza begins uh, by uh, celebrating the way in which the English soldier has conquered uh, the difficult conditions in the colonies uh, and the last part of the stanza in talking about their lies in their lie England's dead also contradicts that it questions that mm. so that is the structuring of the paradox uh, I would say is in a sense deliberate because if we actually also go into uh, you know, early 19th century perceptions, common, commonly held perceptions uh, of, uh, you know, nation building in England. So, this whole imperial enterprise, in a sense, which might have uh, kind of, you know, uh, suited uh, certain people is something that uh, in their own way, the women poets are, uh, you know, questioning. And I uh, think you raised the question very well and uh, uh, soon we should be taking it out. Yes. So, okay. So, uh, as we were discussing uh, Mrs. Heeman's poem, England's Dead, so, uh, you know, she's known for poems on uh, death and mourning.
but these are also poems on war and you know the whole idea of uh, nation building as i said and you know what it is really speaking based on and uh, you know the, the the point that was just raised about how uh, uh, you know ultimately what was a soldier doing till that point so uh, that's where uh, you know uh, you know by uh, kind of juxtaposing the latter part of the stanza with the idea that is raised in the first part i think simmons is also kind of expressing her discomfort with this entire enterprise of uh, you know england kind of moving out and uh, colonizing so um, nature where she sees as something that can be overpowered in this case nature represents uh, the space of the colony the colony that is being overpowered or the other country that's being overpowered and uh, the futility of this exercise is raised uh, with the question as to as to where is the uh, english soldier buried and the fact that they are buried in uh, you know different parts of the world uh, critiques uh, you know the whole notion of valor honor and uh, you know even death that uh, we really speaking look at so much so that you know there are uh, critics who've said uh, that it almost makes it seem uh, as if the graveyard is like a global graveyard but uh, what we also have to keep in mind is that uh, there are so many other people who are obviously uh, you know killed in the process and uh, of course uh, the time period had limitations of its own and uh, women also had access to the world only in a certain way so it is through the english soldier that they are critiquing this entire uh, you know uh, imperial uh, idea of imperial expansion and war actually more importantly so um, with this we move on to another very important poem that was uh, you know published around 1826 and a very very famous poem because i think it's uh, a part of um, a you know all sorts of recitation competitions at the school level it's called casabianca and uh, if you look at uh, you know casabianca it's it's about the poem is about the battle of the nile in which the french fleet uh, you know the orient was destroyed by the english and uh, so it's mrs hemans is talking about uh, a boy uh, who's standing on the deck and he performs his duty and is waiting for the last orders uh, from uh, his father who's also in charge of the ship now uh, she pra praises uh, the kind of uh, sentiment that this young boy has and uh, the boy belongs to the french fleet not to the english and i think this is where the poem needs to be actually looked at from this perspective so uh, if you look at uh, you know uh, the lines uh, the boy stood on the burning deck whence all but he had fled the flame that lit the battle's wreck shone round him o'er the head yet beautiful and bright he stood as born to rule the storm a creature of heroic blood a proud though childlike form and uh, you know towards the end of the poem uh it says with mast and helm and pen fair that well had borne their part but the noblest thing which perished there was that young faithful heart and the young faithful heart is of a french boy so here too we see that instead of talking about uh, you know the, the england's victory in in uh, you know in this case uh mrs hemans is actually talking about the bravery that is shown by this young boy and uh, that becomes the subject of the poem so if we if we we kind of uh, look at these ideas put together i mean in the sense when we look at what ann yearsley's and in fact if we look at mary robinson's depiction of uh, london ann yearsley's uh, discomfort with the slave trade and she devotes a full poem to it uh, then again england's dead and the way they figure in uh, mrs hemans poetry and uh, casabianca which is so very famous uh we realize that uh, the women are very very critical of the whole concept of war and uh, there is uh, th they see it as something that lacks humanity and uh, their sentiments uh, for this reason lie not with uh, any kind of uh, gallant display of uh, national sentiment but their their own sentiments lie with people who are in that sense on the other side and uh, this is something probably as uh, you know we discussed earlier that uh, as women experience their own marginality within spaces both the domestic space and the space outside of it uh, 
uh, they are part of the world i mean uh, the fact that you know they are also writing for a living shows that they understand uh, the fact that uh, the world is not uh, is structured in a way that it doesn't work to their favor so in this way uh, when we look at uh, poetry of this kind we get a broader perspective and and if you look at the dates it's it's right there i think you know uh, during the period of high romanticism and uh, they offer a very very realistic strain to uh, this kind of uh, a world and here again um, if professor Pro uh, prakash uh, well, uh, shares uh, <coughs> two or three important things that you pointed out first is uh, women poets attitude towards war war is very heroic as as has been said in uh, in the poem that you quoted and uh, the the boy was heroic but uh, this heroism is at the cost of as you rightly said nature on one side and the colony on the other so nature is outside london outside england maybe outside europe and so nature is elsewhere and that nature is not just to be harnessed it's supposed to be conquered and uh, conquering of the humanity living in the colonies at that point of time is a very problematic area and uh, men would not be very clearly see uh, seeing this but women you know uh, 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 are conversant with troubles at home a uh, 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 conversant with trouble you know, in, in the domestic space we would see uh, war from a different angle mm -hmm. that angle is of is of violence that anger that, that ang uh, angle is, is of uh, subjugating other people and uh, the pain that is involved in the whole thing so uh, in fact uh, 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 the word uh, uh, realistic strain is mentioned by both of us you uh, particularly and i um, and, and i too but i believe that uh, uh, the the nature at this point of time is being exploited In, in in such a manner that a different view of war occurs in in in, in the process yes especially i think in the poem england's dead mm -hmm. because as mentioned that you know in the first part she constantly talks about very very difficult uh, conditions and how the english soldier is actually kind of and how, harnessing how, uh, all this and how does uh, nation building happen uh, can you explain it a bit in the sense you know that so uh, the way uh, you know if you are looking specifically at poetry by women mm -hmm. i think this whole idea one waging uh, the two things are happening mm -hmm. one is uh, waging a war on other countries mm -hmm. for instance the war between england and france and on the other side is the whole movement into the colonies and the whole uh, the the entire context of uh, slave trade and exploiting the colonies for their resources and destroying nature so nation building is a very violent trend yes and, and it's a very cynical trend it's, it's a very very cynical trend mm -hmm. because if, if if england for instance benefited by the war then then war is taken up and uh, uh, england uh, england's benefit is of nation building what about the people at whose cost na nation is being built yes so that kind of irony is captured well by by, by the romantic poets of the time and and i think as i said the range is uh, i think the access and range of of uh, uh, the world that the women poets have at their hand might be limited mm -hmm. so and but they're making very good use of it mm -hmm. by looking at it certainly from the point of view of the english soldier mm -hmm. uh, and they are not able to kind of look at who are the people he has killed in the process as he dies himself so many that he might have uh, done away with but they are able to kind of uh, you know uh, question uh, what's happening around them and also you know that uh, when you look at the whole thing from the point of view of the colony like india was a colony yes. and the, the the years in india uh, the 1820s uh, were the years of uh, introduction of a new trend in uh, uh, poetry here and uh, that trend you know was very inspiring for the indian slave for the, for the indian subject because romantic poets were talking not just to the slaves elsewhere but also in india in india so these romantic poets became a point of inspiration for the, for, the, for the indian poets indian young poets uh, we, we have uh, discussed in other lectures we were also mm. that uh, the movement of young bengal yes. uh, you know people they were all inspired by the romantic, romantic poetry uh, yeah. coming from and uh, i'm not sure whether uh, the poetry of uh, women at that point of time would be available in india or would that be available any idea i don't think so that wouldn't be available i don't think it was available yes yes and yet you know and the, yet. the spirit of romanticism yes the, the, that spirit you know that nature is is is, is at that point of time is, is being violated is is being killed is being harnessed uh, for for wrong purposes for nation building and colonization 
that somehow gets across to the indian mind at that point of time yes and and they're all uh, in the 19th century in india a period of great uh, reform movements here mm. and as you pointed out also the young bengal movement so minds were totally charged mm. and they were they were all uh, you know greatly influenced by these developments abroad what are the politics of romanticism and in general and uh, the, the politics of the women romantic poets any, any idea I i'm just, just i'm just trying to make a guess i'm wondering i just seek your i think uh, when we uh, look at the women romantic poets there are two things that are happening one is uh, you know a kind of poetry where um, uh, they're only talking about nature in that sense in in you know looking at a kind of looking at the beauty or looking at uh, a kind of uh uh you know the nature itself becoming an important trope in their poetry but at the same time they belong to the real world so on the one hand and this real world is both their domestic space and the space outside so where images from their domestic space figure in their poetry there are also images from outside that mm. figure in their poetry mm -hmm. and uh, you know i think uh, both annias lay and uh felicia himans uh is a case in their their work is a case in point mm. their range in that sense as i said uh you know uh, might be of a different kind mm. but uh nonetheless it is present now uh the question that uh, emerges from your discussion of, of of the points uh is romanticism anti war is romanticism anti nation building if that is the case then indeed uh, romanticism is a very political movement I think romanticism is uh you know totally I would say it's uh, absolutely anti-war and it's against this kind of nation building the mm. romantic poets I think uh I don't think any of the romantics one can actually uh, really think of uh, nation building on these lines and uh, because uh, you know it's a movement that's greatly inspired by the french revolution mm -hmm. so uh, uh, any kind of nation building that is to happen is to happen on the grounds of you know the whole idea of liberty fraternity and equality it's the democratic ideals mm -hmm. that have to go into nation building mm -hmm. and uh, nation building is at the cost of uh, humanity which will die so that you know their resources can be snatched by people from uh, elsewhere yes so if that is nation building then i think this this is uh, uh, destroying the very idea of humanity yes and in in fact we should say that you know romanticism in a sense rejects this idea totally it is so it's it's about peace it's, it's about, about spon peace. about spontaneity yes it's about the goodness of the ordinary man mm -hmm. and uh, if nation building means uh, you know uh, increase in the size of the cities uh, you know bringing uh, them, them uh, to to them industry bringing to them a kind of organization at the cost of the rural mm -hmm. space then you know nation building is a, is, is a negative feature yes and uh, uh, romanticism might stand for humanity as, as a whole no not uh, uh, dividing the world into nationalities or, or or nations so that kind of idea is there in the 19th century and i think that is what inspired people in the colonies the intelligentsia and the colonies to to rise in revolt against the, the colonizing power absolutely and uh, where are women in this <coughs> women are sensitively looking at the whole thing and they are able to connect uh, you know what what is happening in the colonies with what is happening to them or the to the deprived in their own country in their own country mm. correct so uh, if we move on to uh, you know a few more poems by uh, mrs hemans if we look at a poem like the nightingale we can see uh you know uh, sim uh, the tropes that are used in high romantic <coughs> poetry we can see something similar happening here for instance uh, when twilight's gray and pensive hour brings the low breeze and shuts the flower and bids the solitary star shine in pale beauty from afar so we can see that you know uh, the kind of uh, words that are being used the way the different moods of nature are being described is something that we are familiar with and um, uh, you know it 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 brings to i mean the, the poem is titled nightingale so uh, you know and it is part of what is called hymns on the works of nature for the use of children and uh, different of course you know from uh, keats's idea but the poem is also uh, you know a testament of the way women understood nature so uh, for instance uh, for instance there's another one where mrs hemans uh, writes calm on the bosom of thy god fair spirit rest thee now even while with ours thy footsteps trod his seal was on thy brow so we see a uh, use of conventional tropes along with some very very uh, important and uh, uh, you know critical uh, uh, you know uh, tropes and methods that we can see in women's poetry
with this we move on to another poet that uh, i want to discuss today uh, leticia elizabeth landon uh, you know famously uh, known as l e l uh, the uh, you know a, a, a kind of a abbreviated form for name so uh, she was born in 1802 and lived up to 1838 and uh, she wrote as l e l again very very young like felicia himans started writing at the age of 15 Uh, uh Elizabeth Landon started writing at the age of 17 and wrote works like The Improvisatress and uh, uh the catalog of pictures historical sketches uh, and also looked uh, in a big way at uh, the love lyric now this in a sense uh, marks a transition in women's writing a question that was raised right at the beginning of the lecture which was about um how it pans out uh you know by the third decade for instance of the 19th century and one can see a slight shift towards what we will later understand to be a kind of victorian mold for women but that one can see uh, you know uh, that it was gradually setting in for example if we look at a poem of 1829 uh, it's called revenge and uh, it's uh, it's about uh, how this uh, woman addresses a former lover who's now with somebody else and uh, she says a um, i uh, graze upon her rose wreathed hair and gaze upon her smile seem as you drank the very air her breath perfumed the while and uh, you know it goes on in this strain and she finally says this well i'm revenged at last mark you that scornful cheek the eye averted as you passed spoke more than words could speak and she um, she tells her former lover that you know he is going to encounter the same kind of scorn that he has probably uh, left her with and she says by now um, you know all the bitter tears that i have shed for thee the racking doubts the burning fears a wench they well may be and uh, she says i would not wish to see you laid within an early tomb i should forget how you betrayed and only weep your doom uh, but she says this is fitting punishment to live in love in vain so she's uh, you know wishing that he too is going to live in love and win now if you look at it this is a very very conventional sort of a uh, you know uh, in fact uh, it's it's in a sense uh, moving a few notches down compared to uh, poems like england's dead or you know and yearsley's poetry but there is something you know my own sense is that there is something that's happening by the third decade and you know the kind of disenchantment that we were talking about i think that is setting in so there is a kind of movement back within conventional tropes and within conventional spaces where uh, the woman is the woman poet is now kind of talking about uh, a rather acceptable uh, conventional mores uh, in which you know women have been fitted all this while so she says to swell the rack the chain the wheel far better had us thou proved even i could almost pity feel for thou art not beloved and uh, so we see uh, you know a kind of a different understanding which of course you know as i said that later we look at it as a kind of uh, morality that emerges but we see a different understanding a kind of uh, the use of the word sentiment in in a not very complex manner really speaking a very simplistic understanding of uh, sentiment and uh, uh, a simplistic understanding of love that begins to set in and uh, there is for instance a uh, part of what is called uh, the six songs of love constancy romance in constancy truth and marriage there is a section that is titled matrimonial creed and again she you know writes that he must be rich whom i could love his fortune clear must be whether in land or in the funds tis all the same to me and again uh, this poem too ends uh, you know she says that uh, and he must make a settlement i'll have no man without and when he writes his testament he must not leave me out oh such a man as this would suit each wish i hear express if he should say will you have me i'll very soon say yes so uh this uh you know in a sense is a, a movement shift uh, backwards uh though of course uh, you know there are poems a lot of poems that uh, uh letitia landon has written on india she's written a poem on called sati also on india but uh, there is uh, you know i i wonder how you respond to this uh, kind of shift in poetry there's an interesting point that you made that uh, towards the end of its era uh, it, it's it's time uh, 
uh, romanticism is uh, perhaps losing steam and, uh, and is going towards the conventional world. This is the point that you are making. It can also be interpreted as something, you know, that is not possible uh, in the historical period when all these things, uh, you know, are, get written that way. Uh, industrialism is setting in, in England yes. at that point of time. Uh, England is uh, at the cost of the colonies, emerging as a big power. Yes. It already it has defeated uh, Napoleon and, 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 and France, you know, uh, standing behind it. And uh, other forces are coming in, in, in uh, coming to the fore. So maybe historically, uh, romanticism is no more satisfying as it was mm -hmm. earlier. That's the case. But I would say that uh, in the love lyric, as well, when you quoted it, and you also pointed out indirectly, in the love lyric, there is a sense of uh, loss. There, there is a sense of pain, and uh, that pain is not of the individual poet. It's also the times around which yes. uh, the, uh, that, that surrounds the poet. So uh, it's it's a problem that you have raised, and I think uh, viewers this should be considered. And uh, at the end of the lecture, I, I, I would request Dr. Par Nagpal to sum it up in just three sentences. Tell us what exactly is the uh, you know nature of the romantic poets uh, under the category of women romantic poets. I think when we look at uh, and read and analyze poetry by women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the pre-romantic and the romantic period, uh, we need to look at the way they understand their world, mm -hmm. and we need to also look at how they are making their own a lot of tropes that are being used by let's say uh, you know established writers of that period established poets of that period and how out of that they're also creating their own and uh, for instance in this case too uh, you know i mean uh, resorting to the love lyric again so it becomes a way of uh, probably expressing uh, you know the fact that uh, maybe the times are no longer conducive to uh, the world that they wanted, which also kind of drives home the point that the women too visualized a world, a world where everybody was treated equally and they were as inspired by the French Revolution and its ideals as the other poets of that period. There's an <coughs> apt summing up of, uh, of, of the uh, points that Dr. Paya Nagpal made and viewers, I'm sure that uh, you would have been benefited by the discussion, the points that Dr. Paya Nagpal raised. Thank you and thank you Dr. Parnakpal for this lecture. Thank you.